Foss, and I will be your instructor for this class. I'm working as a trainer and a system engineer for many years now, and since 2015 working as an independent professional within the IT Gilder Corporation. As a trainer, uh, I'm delivering many open source courses about system administration, system administration and orchestration, but also security related workshops from mile two. If you read discussions found on the internet about system D, many of the discussions are based on feelings, in my opinion, instead of facts. As a system administrator, I don't want to live in a fact-free world, making decisions on personal or someone other's feelings. That's the exact reason why I personally want to train people to understand in detail what System D is, how it can help your daily administration to work much easier and make your system more secure and so on. This class will be very detailed. We're going into every detail of system D in this course and the next one. This is a class that makes an end of all the gaps you maybe have in your knowledge about system D and makes an end to all the fragmented information you find everywhere on the internet. Of course, we can't examine everything in just a couple of hours. That's why this course is the first one of a series and in the next courses, we will use all the elements in this course to use System D to make your environment more secure. So, welcome to one of our IT Gilda Guru classes. IT Gilda Guru classes are really designed to deliver knowledge for, to open source specialists who wish to deepen their knowledge and expand skill set on a specific topic. The topics in these classes are, in our opinion, important in the today's production environments, but most often knowledge that is very rarely transferred in a structured and concise manner. This course is maybe going too fast to try everything at the same moment that I cover a topic. But luckily this course is recorded and you will have access to it within a couple of days. On a request, you can receive a copy of the slide deck as well. Just leave a message in the chat window. You need a recent Linux distribution, such as Red Hat 8 or Debian Buster to try everything you learned in this course and read more about it in the main pages. To acquire the skills covered in this course, you'll need a solid understanding of the Linux operating system. Be able to work with the best shell or another shell of your choice and know the concepts of process management. If you're not fully convinced of yourself or maybe your knowledge is outdated, I strongly suggest taking an LPI1 course. For more information, just ask me more about it after this course. Last but not least, mastering a text editor is an important skill. You can use any editor. I still prefer the VI editor and do not want to pass up an, an opportunity to advertise the book Practical Vim from uh, Drew Nile. So in this first part of a series of masterclasses about System D, you will learn what System D is and how to use it, the types of processes that you can manage with System D, dependency management, uh, override the properties of existing units to modify the behavior of an existing unit. How to write your own unit files. Working with the system D journal D DBase for logging. And at the end of the course, we'll, we will take the first steps into security, covering some simple directives that will be the first step in hardening your system. So let's start with the introduction of System D. Maybe you are already familiar with some of the features of System D. For instance, you started some services managed by System D on your system. However, I want to make sure that I cover all the basics of System D 
to be sure that we are all on the same track for the next system D courses. When introducing you to system D, it is a good idea to start talking about the boot process of your computer of virtual machines. The first thing you will encounter during this boot process is the BIOS, or on more modern systems, the UAV shell. These firmware systems are responsible for initializing your hardware, and while doing so, giving index numbers to the devices found in your system. We will see in a later course that this is important for device naming in Linux. The BIOS or UAV shell is also responsible for selecting the boot device. Most likely, a boot manager, also called a bootloader, is installed on this device. By the way, on UAV systems, it is possible <coughs> that the bootloader is not on this device, but is moved to the UAV shell file system. The bootloader will start the Linux kernel as the most important part of the Linux operating system. The kernel will read some of the information coming from the BIOS using the API like SM BIOS interface and do some hardware detection, initializing and load drivers that are built in into the kernel. When the kernel is ready with the boot process, it will start the first process, which is widely known as the init system or process, first process. On modern Linux distribution, this init system is system D, although there are alternative systems available. If you use the nice little utility PS3, part of the PSMISC package, you can see that system D is process number one, and that almost everything else is a child process of this first process. A screenshot of this PS3 utility will be on the next slide. System D handles boot and service management processes using targets. The target files in System D are used for grouping different boot units and startup synchronization processes. More about targets later on in this course. When you visit some discussion forums on the internet, you maybe have read some posts arguing that System D is a process that is in control of everything, which can be the cause of possible stability or security problems. Of course, it is possible. However, every init system is designed in the same way. There is a difference with the older SysV init system, because in the past where, uh, there are, where there were other services that were started after the init process, that was heavily dependent on the first process of the kernel. And just to name a few, a UDEV, the login daemon, the whole D daemon, it was really impossible to replace them because they were so dependent on that first process. System D comes with similar components. UDEV is replaced with System D UDEV. The old login daemon is replaced by System D login. But in System D, it is easier to replace them or remove them completely. For instance, in many containers that are based on Linux, the login daemon is gone. As you can see, System D is the first process. Furthermore, there are several other services from the System D project visible on the screenshot, such as System D Journal, System D Login D. System D Network, Resolve, and some others. If you look closer into the boot process, the kernel acts during the boot process as a sort of library, which provides a set of routines for all processes to utilize it, and it starts System D at, as soon as the kernel itself is booted. Almost everything is a child process of the first one. Please notice I said almost everything, because there are processes that are caused by the kernel, 
by drivers, by threads, processes used for scheduling, for protocol independent interfaces that are descendants of process number two. Recording is on. Distant D is responsible for starting up all kinds of things during the boot process, doing as much as possible at the same time, trying to reduce the boot time. Sometimes that is not possible, caused by dependencies, and System D is taking care of that as well. After the boot process, System D is able to activate services on, de on demand, triggered by you or by something that is happening on your system. More about that later on. System D tracks manage mount points. It does not only mount devices during the boot process, but also knows when you mount the device manually. In the Linux kernel, there is an advanced feature that limits, accounts for and isolates the resource usage, such as CPU, memory, storage and network, of a collection of processes. This feature is called control groups, or in short, C groups. Maybe you are familiar with VMware's vSphere product with a function called resource groups. This is more or less the same. Like mount points, System D is able to manage resources and will know if you make a temporary or even persistent change in the available resources for a process. Finally, System D is responsible for many system wide settings, such as the host name and the time zone. Many of these settings have a history of difference between distributions and sometimes even difficult to maintain and manage these settings across distributions. Do you have any idea in how many files, for instance, the hostname can be configured looking at the different distributions? And I'm not even talking about the differences between the kernel node and name, those names received via DSP and so on. That's why System D is providing us with an alternative. And sometimes it can be even user specific. For instance, you can have multiple users on a system, each living in their own time zone without any problem. System D is an event driven system. There is a sort of a problem with this terminology. It is used before in another init system called Upstart. However, it's not the same. In System D, you have to take this word very literally. An event is everything that happens on your system. For instance, a new device is introduced on your system. A device is mounted, or even something simple as it is 12 o'clock. If you want to manage an event, you need to configure a unit. A unit is the base entity that is managed by System D. And you can configure the unit using unit files that contains configuration directives that describe the unit and defines its behavior. Beside the unit configuration, a unit can inherit properties from C groups and process number one. In this course, we are not going to enter the world of C groups. It's abbreviated from control groups and they will be covered in more detail in the next courses. For now, C groups is a Linux kernel feature that limits, counts for, and isolates the resource usage of a collection of processes. Unit files can be stored on many different locations. SystemD itself comes with a collection of unit files, and also if you install software, the package can contain unit files. These unit files are stored in the directory userlib systemd system. Please notice that you should not, no way, under any circumstances, change these files. If you want to change settings coming from these unit files in userlib systemd system, 
you can override them in the etc systemd system directory <coughs> this is also the directory where you can store your own unit files the slash run systemd system directory contains units that are the result from auto generated units Good examples are units that are the outcome of the conversion of the slash etc fs tab file. Furthermore, temporary unit files created by the systemd run command are also saved in this directory. There is also a location where the user can store unit files for units that he or she wants to manage. Talking about the systemd, systemd unit command, you can start every Linux command with systemd run in front. There are two possible reasons to use this command in front of other commands. You need resource control during the execution of the program, or you want to schedule the command, or even both. Systemd is even an excellent replacement for the utilities add and batch. There are different types of units. Let us quickly discuss them. The service to manage a script or process. The socket to activate a service on demand for, for um, utilities or scripts or daemon that should be activated by knocking on specific TCP ports or streams coming in into the standard input. Mount and swap units to replace etc fs tab. Yes, etc fs tab is deprecated nowadays. Auto mount to replace the old design by Sun auto fs daemon. Timer to replace anacron and cron. And a device unit, a unit that are dynamically created for devices that are detected by the kernel. Uh, think about uh, block devices and network devices. The path unit to manage and monitor files and directories. This one is really cool. It can check if a directory or file exists and create it for you if necessary, but also if the content of a directory is changed and then trigger a service to do something with it. For instance, create a new backup. A slice, system-wide resource management using cgroups. Scope, the same, but now for users. A target is a collection of other units. Used during boot, or just to start a more complex system, such as an NFS server that needs several daemons to provide a complete solution. The link for naming and configuring network devices. The NetDev to create virtual network devices. The network unit, complete replacement for network managers such as Red Hat's network managers and SUSE wickets. Resolved, resolving of DNS names. And the nice thing about Resolved is that you can make it even specific for an interface. So if traffic is coming in via, for instance, network card number zero, the outcome will be different for uh, another network interface, which can be useful in multi-home situations and scenarios. Sometimes you need secure DNS. Also, that can be um, fixed and used within Resolved. ZeroConf slash Avai, something that Apple invented to discover devices on your network and used for many devices nowadays, uh, such as printers, and it's becoming the de facto standard within IPv6. The implementation is now done via DNS SD. And the latest on this slide, NSPawn.
for systemd containers, which will be covered in the third course about systemd. Getting help. Please don't go on all the different sites with opinions about systemd and how to configure them, etc. Then the put ring that the main developer of systemd has a nice blog and has even a website systemd.io with a lot of information about systemd. And also he's the author of many nice man pages. And I listed a few that are important to start with. Systemd index to list all the man pages from the systemd project. Systemd directives, index of configuration directives. Systemd.syntax, which is the general syntax of systemd configuration files. So the directives that are the same for every unit. And sorry, I, I made a mistake. And so systemd syntax is about the, the general syntax and the systemd unit is about the directives that are the same for every unit type and also how to format them. And sometimes you need a comma separated list, sometimes it's uh, space divided. You, you will find that in the systemd.unit. And then there is a, a man page for every type. So systemd.server, systemd.network, and so on. So if you want to visit that man pages, it is a good idea not to use the man command, but to use the pinfo comment. Oh, I shared the wrong window. No. And what I'm always doing is create an alias and for instance I am going to visit system the directives. You can see that it's acting now just like a text based browser. And you can just enter, it will go to that man page, go to the next one, use the left arrow, and you're back in the man page uh, containing all the directives. I really do think that the usage of pinfo makes sense if you want to use the man pages of system D instead of using the old man command uh, because then you have to remember which uh, uh, man page you want to open and in which section and so on it's in my opinion uh, easier to use the info and just create an alias for it On purpose, I created an error in the Apache configuration. It will not start. The active state is failed. The state is failed when the unit exits with another code than zero. The log states that there is a syntax error on line 159. Besides the state failed, a state can have the active state or one of the states that are mentioned on this slide. Activating and deactivating means uh, that on demand something is happening. 
And these statuses are only used by using socket units. Inactive is never activated or the job is done. Reloading, you change one of the directives of the unit for a few seconds, it will be reloading, or sometimes even milliseconds. The line loaded from the status output can also give us information about the unit. We already covered loaded. It is in memory and displays the location of the unit file on disk, except if it's not found. If the unit file contains a bad setting or a formatting error, it is also visible. Besides starting, stopping, enabling and disabling a unit, you can mask a unit using the systemctl mask command, which links with the help of a symbolic link the unit to slash dev slash null to prevent it from starting, triggered by you or a dependency. Please remember from the previous, previous module that a unit file in etc systemd system overrides the one in lib systemd system. And that's the reason why the symlink to slash dev slash null works. The systemctl status command also displays the last 10 entries from the journal dbase. If you want to see more, Use the dash dash lines directive and to prevent truncation at dash dash full. In the first module of this course, we briefly talk, talked about the available units. In the latest section of this module, I'm going to cover some of the unit types in more detail. At the end of the next module, I will summarize both this module and the next one with a demonstration. A unit file is written in the old IMI format, and it often starts with a section named unit. This section contains a description and many optional parameters, such as the location where you can find documentation and also dependency settings. It always needs a section with the name of the type and the section for this specific unit, and optionally, it can contain an install section that describes what should happen if you execute the command systemctl enable. So let's look into a service unit file. As already mentioned, this type can be used to many scripts and daemons. The type parameter is used to tell systemd how to execute it. You can see how a service is started and stopped, and that there is an environment file configured that contains variables that are known to this unit file and to the process that are started by this unit. So, in this scenario where you can see the environment file etc default SSH, the variables used in this file are not only visible within the context of this unit file, but also for the process itself. Another interesting thing is that whatever happens to the process, systemd will try to restart a unit after a specified interval. That's the restart directive. If the interval is not defined in this unit file, the default value is taken from slash etc systemd system.conf. There are also several settings that may be used to change the service view of the file system, such as the runtime directory and working directory, amongst many others. In this course, but also in the next ones, we will cover many of these directives, because they can play an important role in the hardening of your system. In this example of the SSH service, there is one parameter that is not recommended. Kill mode is process. This setting on a Debian Buster uh, machine is actually a way of saying systemd is not responsible at all 
for the result of systemctl's stop or kill commands. If the process is still running after such a command, systemd can't help it. If it's set to mixed, the sick term signal is sent to the main process, while the subsequence signal, uh, sick signal, signal is sent to all remaining process of the unit control group. Another possibility is to use kill mode is control group. It will use sick kill for all processes, which is very aggressive. So just doing kill des kill des nine. Sometimes it is better to set the value of this directive to none and use the exec stop directive to define how to stop the process. For instance, Apache CTL stop. <coughs> there are many services that comes with utilities to control a daemon. The last directive I want to mention is type. As I uh, stated in the beginning of this slide, it's about how systemd executes it. Notify is saying you not are go not only are going to start this daemon, but you're also going to trigger other units that are dependent on this unit. So for instance, if the network target is one of the dependencies of this service, and you are going to introduce a new network interface into your system, system, uh, system D will inform SSS and it will reload the main process so it is able to listen on this new network interface and also the other way around. So Notify is always in two way, two directions. It's sending messages from and receiving messages coming from dependencies. Another popular value of this same type setting is forking. You need it when the parent process is expect, expected to exit when startup is complete, which is the default behavior of many more traditional daemons, such as MySQL. Sockets are available to activate service units on demand, which can be very useful for web servers, secure shells, etc. A socket file always needs a corresponding service file. So in this scenario, there is an Nginx socket, which is just going to listen on a specific port, and there will be an Nginx service that will be triggered by the socket as soon as someone is knocking on this SSL port. The file etcfs tab is maybe still available in your system, and you are maybe still using it to mount file system during boot. But systemd is converting it into unit files. You can find them in the directory slash run slash systemd slash generator. Therefore, instead of using slash etcfs tab any longer, it is maybe a better idea to create them yourself. It gives you much more control and especially from the point of secure orchestration, uh, it's much easier to deploy than editing a single file. The name of the mount unit must always reflect the location of the mount point. That means that if you want to mount a device on the directory slash sv slash repo, the file name must be sv dash repo dash mount, or in the example on this slide, if you want to mount slash so, uh, a device on slash mnt slash backup, the name of the mount unit will be mnt dash backup dot mount. If you have any doubts about the name of the unit file, uh, for instance, there are already dashes in the directory name or strange symbols, 
the systemd escape utility is available to generate the mount unit names. Please notice that some older versions of systemd expect that you also set the where is directive to indicate the mount point itself. On the new, in the newer versions of systemd, it's not uh, necessary any longer for the reason that the name of the unit file already indicates what the mount point is. Very similar to the mount unit, there is also a unit file type for swap partitions and swap files. The mount unit, and of course also the swap unit, are there for local file systems. If you want to mount remote file systems provided by a Samba or NFS server, the auto mount service makes sure that the mount is always available for you if you need it. Configuration is very easy, especially if you compare it to the old Sun methods. Please notice that the name of the auto mount unit must be the same as the name of the mount unit, only the suffix is different. I have really no idea if I am the only one, but I always hated con and anacol. Difficult to remember the syntax, a configuration of files, they could be everywhere. I'm so happy, so glad that there is an alternative now. Yes, it is maybe a little more configuration work. You need a service unit and a time unit. And similar to the auto mount and the mount units, the name must be the same. The time format, however, is very flexible, and the main page systemd.time, not timer, contains many examples in the event section. Some distributions have an extra systemd package in their repo, systemd cron, with a target that automatically converts all the old crons everywhere on your file system, including the user-specific ones, into timers, which is great. A target is a collection of units. For instance, there is a target unit for timers, and another one for local file systems. Often a target is called during the boot process. This way, you don't have to configure every single unit with their dependencies. A target can be isolatable, which means that if you call the target, everything that is not in the target will be shut down. And also the other way around, if you start a target, every unit in the target will be started. So system, system CTL isolate will shut down everything that is not in the target. System CTL start specific target will start everything that is in the target. One example of an isolatable target is the rescue tar target. It only contains the unit types that are necessary to repair your system and does not contain any unit that can be a risk factor during the repair. An isolatable target can be started during boot. You can set this specific target permanently using the systemctl set default parameter, or override the default target as a kernel parameter from the bootloader configuration using the systemd.unitis directive which is of course very useful for debugging purposes. Uh, yeah, use the rescue target or even the systemd.debug shell target to reset your password. The very first target executed by systemd is the default target. This target is a symbolic link to a target that is configured as default with the command systemctl set default. 
On workstation, this target is most of the time the graphical target. On servers, it's most of the time the multi-user target. We didn't cover the dependency handling in systemd yet, but the most important setting here is the requires directive. This target will be started and it must be successful. So on this slide, you can see that the multi-user target is required. So that, will, that one will be started first before executing the graphical target. And that story continues. Before the multi-user -target, target is executed, the basic target must, must be executed. And it must be successful as well. And finally, the one without the requirement, this init target. All of these, these targets are used as checkpoints to really ensure that all the required services are up and running before moving on to the next higher level target. It is, of course, a little bit more complex than I just told you. And I strongly suggest that you have a good look at the man page boot up. Yes, there is actually a man page with the title boot up. And I definitely have to tell you more about dependency handling. For the break, we learned more about some of the unit file types that are available within systemd. And there are even some examples on the slides of existing unit files. So in this section, I will show you how to modify existing unit files and create your own. But before we're going to do that, we are going to talk about the way dependencies are handled in systemd. Remember that when I introduced systemd to you, I said systemd is responsible for starting up all kinds of things during the build process. Doing as much as possible at the same time, trying to reduce the boot time that sometimes that is not possible because there are dependencies and there must be order in starting in the starting of unit files systemd is taking care of that as well so let's have a look at how systemd does that for us so again if you look into the structure of a unit file uh, it's formatted in any format. And there are two sections that has a relationship with dependency handling, the unit and the install section. So let's start with the first one. Uh, the, in the unit file that you see here, it's an empty one, of course, it's an example, there's only description and documentation. But you can add several directives to handle dependencies. The once and required directives configures with units which units must be started at the same time. And if their success is required for the status of this unit. So if you configure the unit with a once and it fails, yeah, too bad, but the whole status of this unit is not affected. But if you are using required and the unit listed as a requirement failed, this unit will fail as well. There is another one similar to the required directive, requisite, which is not very common because it requires that the service is already started. If a unit file has a conflict setting on another unit, starting the former will stop the latter and vice versa. So conflicts really means please stop the listed units if they are already started. 
A very nice example of the conflicts is the one in the rescue target. It conflicts with many, many other targets, meaning they will be shut down. So the rescue target is pretty minimal in number of processes. You can always specify multiple units with all these directives using a space separated list. If you don't want to start the dependencies at the same time as the unit, you can bring order with the after and before directives. After means that this unit will start after listed units and before the other way around. Using the binds to dependency type together with after ensures that a unit never reaches the active state without a specific, a specific other unit also in the active state. So this behavior is similar to the requisite parameter, but the difference is that the requisite just checks if the listed unit is already available, otherwise it will fail. It will not start the, the other unit. But binds to together with after make sure that it is started completely. And then this, run, this unit will be run. As stated, the install section also contains some dependency handling. The install section is used when you enable the unit with the help of the systemctl enable command. First of all, it creates a symbolic link in the directory that contains all the units for the, spe for the specified target. The target unit can be configured with the wanted by or required by directive. The difference is that if the unit fails, the required by directive makes the status of the whole target into a fail state, which is actually never a good idea. So the behavior is consistent with the wants and requires directive in the unit section. The biggest advantage of this method is that you add the whole target as a dependency at once. The alias directive is not saying anything about dependencies, but makes it possible to call the unit file under another name as well. This can be very helpful if there are differences between distributions. <coughs> For instance, in Red Hat based distributions, the OpenSSS server is named SSSD, in Debian it's SSH. Debian created in their version of the SSS servers an alias SSSD. So you can actually say systemctl enable SSS or systemctl enable SSSD. And the same for all other systemctl commands. The list dependencies parameter of systemctl can show the configured dependencies for you and their order. The biggest problem of this command is that the list can be overwhelming. And then it can take a lot of time uh, to check all the server services this way. Luckily, another utility is available for you. It makes it much easier. Systemd analyze. <coughs> the blame parameter can tell you how much time it costed servers during the boot processes. Boot process. Another nice option is the plot option that actually generates an SVG file, an image with all the units, their dependencies and starting types. This can really help to get an overview and troubleshoot slow boot times or even failing units. The downside of this plotted SVG file is that it really shows every unit and you cannot filter out things. The dot parameter can be used to limit the output to one or more units. It actually generates a textual dependency graph description in the dot format. And if you want to um, create a visual image from this graph description, there is a cool tool called dot. And you can find that in the graphics package.
So, I already mentioned that a unit file contains specific properties for units, and then many other properties are inert from C groups or process one. Actually, uh, if you're talking about C groups, it's mostly about uh, directives for things running as a user, and uh, all the rest of the units it's uh, inherited from process one. There are many reasons why you want to change an existing unit file. In our series about system D, the main reason is adding security measures to the unit file. The systemctl show command can be used to view all the settings for a specific unit. In the screenshot on this slide, you can see a part of the output for the SSS servers. I do think, as I already mentioned during the break, that the main page of systemd directives can be very helpful if you want to modify the behavior of the unit. And instead of dumping everything, you can use the property parameter to view a specific one. Properties that are resource related, that's coming from cgroups, can be overridden with the help of the systemctl command. You don't have to, have to restart the unit, they are in effect immediately. The settings are by default persistent and stored in the etc systemd system.control directory. In our example, etc systemd system control sss.service.d. In the example on this slide, the property IP accounting is enabled, which, not, which is necessary if you want to have a good look at the incoming and outgoing traffic, and it's also needed if you want to enable access control on a specific service. Adding the parameter dash dash runtime will have the effect that changes are not made in subdirectories of etc systemd, but in slash run slash systemd. With identical immediate effects. However, since the letter is lost on reboot, the changes are lost too. For all other settings, for all other properties, you can use the systemctl edit command. It will start an editor, defined by the editor or systemd underscore editor variable. If there are not already overrides available, an empty file is created. Add a section for a specific unit type and the properties you want to override. You can also use systemctl edit with the dash full parameter, which will copy the existing unit file into the override. And in my opinion, that's just a matter of taste. This time, you have to restart the unit and you need to execute the systemctl daemon reload command. Otherwise, the settings inherited from process one or from the existing units are still in effect. One can say that you simply can create a new file with the same name as the original unit in the etc system, the system directory, because that will override the original one in libsystemd. But it's not a good, very good idea to deploy the override this way. You will lose the possibility to see the differences. The systemctl cat command will show you both original unit file and the override. And the system the this delta command can be very useful to list all the differences for all the units. In the example on this slide, the SSSD service has an override for the property protect home, which is in fact a property that I will, will cover in the last module of this course. Please notice that the directory where the override is stored is etc systemd system and then the name of the unit, sssd.service.d, and d is for directive, in, and the file name is override.conf.
Of course, creating your own unit file is nothing more than creating a file in slash etc systemd system. But there are a few things that really can help to make it easier for you. I also want to cover user-specific units because we want to give our users the ability to run and manage their own services. If we trust a user to log in to the server, and we have good policies controlling this, then we should let them run the services they need and not get in their way. But again, you need policies controlling this. You need auditing, etc., before you're going to give the user that clearance. When you create your unit file, please keep them at first as simple as possible. Try it, view the results, and then add the more advanced stuff. And the journal CTL command will provide you with all the debugging information if needed. And please don't add too many dependencies. There are the targets for a reason. And don't use uh, too much the wants or required directive. Again, there are re targets for a reason. Now remember that targets such as local FS, remote FS, and network online exist. There is even a man page for the special targets like this that exactly describes their behavior. You can even create your own target if necessary. Just add the target to the install section and you will be okay. Don't mix the after and before directives. It makes debugging harder. Just choose one of them. And it's not only the debugging that makes it harder, but um, it also increases the boot time if necessary. Split your workload in multiple units. Instead of using exec start pre and post directives with, with commands that are needed before the uh, service can run. It makes debugging also easier. But it's also necessary when you add security measures to the unit file. Because the security measures applies to all directives, including exec start pre and exec start post. And sometimes you have to be a little less or more strict for a specific command. Read the man pages. One of the things I really like of uh, Leonard Puttering is that he adds so many examples, recommendation, or tell you when something is not a very good idea. The man pages are really cool. Have a good look at existing unit files, but don't depend on it, because sometimes the Debian on Debian, but I show it also on other distros, the things that are written in man pages, such as this is not a good idea, don't do it except, where, yeah, they maybe they just didn't read it. Yeah, we saw the example of the SSS service. It's explicitly stated in the man page, don't do it this way. And on Debian, it's done this way. And I saw it many times. So it's a good idea to look into existing unit files, but always verify it with the main page. And also, learn from generated unit files. There are even commands available that can generate a unit file for you. A good example of such a command is systemd mount. You can see in the screenshot that I executed the command sudo systemd mount and then the dev block device and then the mount point. And I didn't even had to create the slash mnt slash data directory. Systemd mount did that for me. And the output of the command was started unit mnt Slash data dot mount for mount point slash mnt slash data. 
Of course, you have to check that. Yes, it's done. And then you can just do a systemctl cat mount data.mount. And it will give you a very good starting point for your mount unit. Just at the install section, where if I want it by its local FS target, and you're done. And there are more commands that can generate units for you. Systemd run is a good example. And there are also many generators in the lib systemd directory. And some of them can help you to generate just a new file. Other ones are there to convert old init scripts for you. In the second course, I'm going into much more details concerning user management and systemd. For now, it's enough to tell you that you can run systemd units under a specific user and group, user using the user is and or group directives. You can even say user is percentage e. And if you do that, create a unit name, for instance, um, VSFTPD at dot service and enable it or start it as, for instance, systemctl start nobody at uh, VSFTPD, no, sorry, uh, systemctl start VSFTPD at nobody dot service and the FTP the service will be started under the user nobody. As an unprivileged user, you can start and even auto start units while logging in by creating them in the directory .config systemd user. The same commands are available for you as the system as the system wide units. Just add the dash dash user parameter. Are there questions? No questions at all. Okay, I'm going to demo some things for you. So what I'm going to do is show you um, how units can work together. So we're going into a mount unit, a service unit, and even a timer unit to show you the power of working with units. And I'm even going to show you uh, how to use the path unit. In the second demo, I will show you how to replace the CDD service with a socket unit. For the Solely reason that CND is not in active development any longer, even not in maintenance for years, which is simply a security risk. So if everything went well, then you see my terminal now, and I already prepared one thing for you. I created a very easy script. What you can see here is that the script does nothing more 
then just create a tarball of files in the slash var backup directory. And I just added some files to this directory to have something to backup. So if I execute the script, and I'm going to give me my, my, um, this user full privileges. There should be something in slash TMP. And yes, I can see an archive created. going to delete it for now. So there are some things I want to do. First of all, um, what I want is that th this script can be started as a service. So system needs service, let's say backup. Oh, and another one, Backup Now, that's a good name. Service. So uh, nothing more than this. And as you can see, an archive is created. Started simple backup, the backup is started at. So it's very, very easy. If you look into the service, you can see there is no, that's a uh, on purpose, no install section. Because I can add an install section, but it will only affect the, have the effect that it can be started at boot. Normally, you want to start a backup on a certain time. So, let's create a timer. Wait, before I'm going to do that, I'm going to take note of the current time of this system. So, let's say you don't know the syntax. Run system D time. And there is a section called calendar events. With a complete description and many, many examples. So you can use um, uh, just daily or replace it by um, 
world card this, world card this, world card, etc. So many examples are available. And this one needs an install section. For the collection of timers. And you can see that within four minutes, this backup will be started. Do you have questions about this, the first part of this demo? Okay, let's make it a little bit more complex. So, what I'm going to do is create a more complex surface. So, I'm going to change this one. And I'm going to use the binds to directive. And I want to make sure that the device that I want to use as a backup source is available. So what I'm going to do is find out the device name. So, first I'm going to write, I'm going to execute the shell, system CTL list units, type device, and I'm going to grab on the first partition on the second drive. And here it is. Uh, copy. And I want it also and I want also that it's not only the block device itself that's available but also that the uh, file system on top of this device is mounted. So the, the block device must be active and the mount must be active. And this, this service must be started so using the after directive for the same units. So I'm going to copy and paste and just change it into after. So next thing to do is change my backup script. So the destination will be slash mnt slash backup and I need a mount backup dot mount unit but I'm lazy so what I'm going to do is systemd mount mnt backup the device sdb1 system ctl cut mnt backup mount 
right? I'm going to redirect that mount unit to mt backup dot mount. And I have a great unit for my backup directory. So, systemctl start um, daemon reload, sorry, because I changed an existing unit. And there it is. Do you have any questions about this part of the demo? Simple question. In the unit, in the description, or anywhere else in the unit file. Does the sequence do uh, anything, or it doesn't matter how you do the sequence? Uh, only, only, for, only, only the only section. section. Okay. So I can change after and binds to, that doesn't matter. That doesn't matter, okay. Yeah. Other questions? Okay. I'm going to remove the files here. And I'm going ancient one step further. So you can see the archives are gone. And what I'm going to do now is create a new service type, a unit, sorry, unit type. A path unit. If necessary, create the destination directory of change so. What I'm doing here is say, okay, if MNT backup doesn't exist, please create it. And if something changed, oh, I made a mistake here. If something changed in this directory, please execute backup now dot service. Oh. Sorry, I wasn't through it. Oh, I was through it.
Uvar Bekub. Okay, so you can see it's empty. And let's create uh, some other content. Also to this directory. So I made made three changes. First of all, one was created because the, the path was new. The second one was created because I changed it, changed the group file. The third archive was created because I copied some new files into the directory. Is this cool or not? Yes, it's nice. So, let's do another demo. So what we are going to do, as stated, is the conversion of a Xenit D service. So, what I'm going to do first is just Uh, install CNETD. And you can see there are several services that in the past were running under CNETD, such as the echo command. And the echo uh, command was used to see if the server was reachable. That was one of the main reasons why this um, command exists. And the command is simply disabled by default also under CNETD. Shut up, Siri. So we need, let's say that we need a replacement for this service. Of course, we need a binary that we can use to emulate the internal echo service of CNED. I created, therefore, A little Python script, at least I did. I do think that I removed a little bit too much. Hopefully, I'm not going to make any mistake here. So what it does is just reading a line of text coming in from the standard input and strips all the spaces from the beginning and the end and echo it in uppercase. 
And by the by the way, the only reason that I was able to reproduce this that is it's coming from a lab that I already executed so many times that I can really write the code uh, um, by head. Not that I'm so good in Python. So we need a service. And we want to trigger the echo command with a socket. So what we are going to do is put the add sign after the name of the service. This is uh, the way how you can template the port that is needed. So, the unit file, just an exec start, and the standard input is a socket, meaning that there is a socket needed to trigger this. Another way is using a network socket, such as a TCP port, but we are just going to use a socket. I already copy and paste the, for timing reasons, what I want to do here. So, what I'm doing here is create a type socket, listening on a specific port, <coughs> enable it, when accept is yes. So the socket is started, so we should be able to see the service running. Yes, it's running. Okay, we're going to test it. As you can see, it's working fine. The next thing I want to do is say, okay, this service is not secure at all. So I don't want to use to uh, allow users from a certain subnet to actually use this service. So first of all, I'm going to show, to see what subnets I'm in, and as you can see, this is my subnet. Verify it. And as you can see, there is a delta created using a drop in unit file extension. I told you in the slides. So, first of all, we are going to see if it still works. On localhost, yes, I'm going to my 
desktop machine. Now, there in this kit is called NC. As you can see, it doesn't work. You can emulate, re-implement is the better word for it, everything that was in Xenid D and much more in a way that is much more secure than Xenid D. Questions? Maybe also interesting, oh, come back to the machine, to see the status of the Um, the I call it echo. I think where is my mistake? Yeah, this is a socket listening. So why is this failing? Did I call it something else? That is possible. No. Yeah, that's normal. And what you can see here, the status is just dead. Also interesting, and uh, I'm going into the journal CTL within a moment, but it's a tool to uh, query the logging database. We're going to some reason. Can't see. I'm searching now for the the trigger of the. Uh, that's why. <laughs> mm. Here you can see it coming in. Before I'm going to give you another demo um, regarding some uh, security settings you can uh, do within uh, System D, I'm going to tell you, as promised, a little bit more about logging. Just a few slides to make sure that you remember how it works. Because in a series of 
courses about system D, uh, where security is the main topic, we have to talk about logging. And not only in this first course, but of course in all the courses in this series, four in total. So, system D is the first process. And everything is a child process of system D. It's maybe already the first time <laughs> that I repeat that sentence. Another thing that I mentioned about system D is that it keeps track of everything that is happening on your system. For instance, if you start a unit, the system D can capture everything that is happening around that single event. The system D journal daemon takes all that information and stores it in a journaling database. You can query the database using the journal CTL command. Please notice the system D journal D daemon is not needed to query this database. It is not a master slave architecture. It's more comparable to a DBA system such as SQLite. It is possible to integrate SystemD journal with other logging services such as Syslog NG and RSyslog by giving them access to the DBase or by forwarding all the information to a Syslog service. So there are actually two possibilities. Uh, for Syslog NG, there is Syslog NG mod journal as, pl as a plugin. And for rsyslog, rsyslog, there is the IM journal module, but you can also say to uh, systemd journal d in his configuration file, please just forward all traffic to the local syslog server. <coughs> of course, using the plugin is a better approach because if you're talking about logging, you're also talking about standardization. And the current implementations of the syslog protocol are not conform RFC 5425. And system D journal D is for the full 100% compatible with this RFC. So uh, if you don't use one of the plugins, it means that some information can be lost. Systemd is not designed to work as a central logging mechanism for all of your servers. It's there for local debugging purposes. However, there is a command, not installed by default and not available in the repo of all Linux distributions, to receive serialized journal events and store them into the journal files. It can become especially handy when you are debugging access remote file systems or security related incidents. When you make it into the fourth uh, course of, syst of this system D series, we will do that to display some of the security measures, even on kernel level. I also want to mention that the information in the system D journal D DBase for a specific unit uh, is also available if you execute the command systemctl status, as we did before. The journal CTL command is available to query the DBase. There are parameters to query the DBase for specific units, identifiers, and boot sessions. Systemd journal D reads also the kernel link buffer containing all the messages generated by the kernel, for instance, if new hardware is detected. Journal, journal CTL D message is a good alternative for the old D message command. One of the biggest advantages of a DBase is that you can query the DBase to filter for specific information. You can filter on priority and the terms that you can use as a value for this priority are the same as the syslog protocol priority on timestamps uh, uh, um, as the syslog priority. 
You can also filter on timestamps and much more. Text-based log files are often monitored with the Linux command tail-f. It displays new entries when the log grows. The dash follow parameter does exactly the same. The great thing is that you can combine all filters. It is really great that you can do something like journal CTL dash dash unit SSS dash dash follow and even add more filters. And before I forgot to tell you, the journal CTL has excellent support for autocompletion, including the filters. Hence, there is even autocompletion for all the fields where you can filter on. Just press Ctrl plus I multiple times. It tries to be exact. Because systemd knows everything, you can make a query on so many fields, which makes it so powerful. The dash over both parameters displays the fields that you can use in the query. In the output of this slide, you can see some of the logging around the SSSD unit. A user tried to log in, but there was an authentication failure. You can see at the bottom of the slide. Please notice the syslog facility and priority fields. And if you have some time left, just go to the RC I mentioned before and uh, see what they mean. And also uh, find out what the differences are with the normal syslog priorities from syslog NG and R syslog. Since SysD Journal is designed for local logging for incident management and debugging purposes, it's not needed to make the database persistent across reboots. It's better to have a central logging system in place, such as RSYSLOG. However, in a test environment or even at home, it can be very useful to make it persistent. Modify slash etc systemd journal d.conf where you also can find all kind of parameters uh, for log rotation and set the storage parameter to persistent or auto. I prefer using uh, the parameter you, uh, persistent, otherwise you have to create the complete directory structure, setting the permission and so on. If you just use persistent, you make systemd do all that hardware work for you. And by the way, don't forget to reload the daemon to make the dbase persistent. <coughs> and in this case, you need not only a normal reload, but a force reload. And the reason for that is that the journal D uh, daemon also communicates with the dbus interface of the kernel. So, you can now use the boot ID to filter on specific boot sessions. The current boot ID can be found using the hostname CTL command. And for some reason, the arrow in this slide moved from boot ID to static hostname, but I really mean the boot ID. And you can also use the journal CTL dash dash list boots commands, which will uh, show you the current one, as a zero, and the ones before, with negative numbers. And of course, you can use this information to filter out, for instance, the errors during a specific boot session. Sometimes, during that incident or change management, it can become handy to add lines into the journal D database yourself. The systemd cat utility that I also used in the backup script is available to do so. You need to set the identifier, which is nothing more than a label, priority, and the commands which generates the standard output that will go into the database. In the example above, uh, it's echo, but there are other commands available such as print and printf, or maybe you want the output of another command. Every command is valid. In this 
go into one of the services and just look into it if we can add some extra security measures. And to make it easier, I'm going to make myself root and I'm going to use tmux and the nice thing about tmux is that you actually can split panes so what I'm going to do is do it like this and that makes it possible to open here oh not like this system ctl edit sshash dot service i don't want to use nano export editor is user bin vim export the system d editor is user bin vim yeah system ctl edit sshash dot service so and now i'm going to the upper screen and so like this and going to execute system ctl show sshash service so we will start our override with service and look into some of the parameters that can be interesting for security reasons. And I like to use security reasons in a very broad view of security. For instance, um, I do think that resource management can be a part of resource management as well, as I will explain in the next course so one thing i want to do is add cpu accounting this that gives me the possibility to put a limit for instance 50 percent or less on uh, processes that are already started the same for IO accounting. Another one is the new mask. And I hope that you still remember what the UMass does. It's the, the permission that is given into newly created files. And in my opinion, a UMass of 0022 which will give a default permission on a file of 644 is a little bit too much by default so i'm going to change that to let's say 0077 going further into the configuration
And private TMP means that the process gets its own slash TMP directory. For SSH, that's not so important. Network, also not so important here. Private network means that there will be an isolated network created for uh, this process, which makes SSH really unusable. But I am interested in Protect Home and System. Protect Home can make the home directory read only while using SSH. And Protect System is full, makes also directories such as slash boot, slash var, and some others read only. So these are already some nice settings that you can add to make your system more secure. Okay, it's running fine. And I'm going to log in again. As you can see, slash boots is read only. Home directories are read only. ETC read only. So on is read write. And if I create a new file in slash TMP. You can see that something strange happened here. Can someone explain this for me? You change the U mask. Yeah. yeah. Is this uh, conform the U mask? I think so. 0077? Yeah. Is this not a little bit too much? Oh yeah. Yeah. There is a reason for that. Slash TMP has a sticky bit. Ah. <laughs> and sticky bit yeah. uh, gets also some permissions extra. Your mask is no, never the only thing that uh, helps to improve your system security. What may I have a question? May I uh, ask a question? Yes, of course. You have said the uh, read only option for home. Yeah. But also boot is read only and etc is read only. You didn't ask for that. So, yeah. uh, what's happening here is that users coming in via SSH cannot modify the system in any way. If the same user is logged in via a VPN solution or locally, it can modify the system and write files into its home directory. Yeah, okay, but you set it to home read only. Yeah. In, in, but everything is read only now. No, not everything. Slash TMP. Yeah, okay. Slash far TMP. But, but ETC also. Yeah. So. But you only are for home. No, protect system is full. Ah, that's it. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Okay. So it is a very easy way to make the system more secure. Yeah. Yeah, yeah.
And you can also do it for specific users. So now I did it now for every SSH user, but you can also do it for specific users. Now in the next course, I will go in much more detail about uh, users and system D, how you can change the view, their view of the file system, uh, how you can change the view for file systems from the point of view of the running demons, uh, going of course in the network details, etc., etc. Uh, this was just uh, very fast, uh, but very useful in daily life um, uh, methods to just add a little security. Um, in Tmux, you can do Control B. Followed by we can't see your Double screen. Quotes. We are looking at you. We don't see the screen. Yeah. And then use, use Control plus B arrow keys to switch between the sessions. Is that uh, what you are, were asking for? Oh, uh, Another thing for the people in the room that uh, did already the second uh, session, uh, I completely rewrote the second one. And you are free to join again uh, without extra cost. I added much more details and much more demos to the second one. It will be in Genoa. Uh, I do think the, the, uh, the 18th of Genoa. I hope you did enjoy this first part and that we are all on the same track now uh, to go into a lot of security related details. As I already mentioned, we're going into user management. Uh, we are going into uh, networking, etc., etc. If you want a copy of the slide deck, please send a mail, and the mail is in the chat window now. And I will send it to you tomorrow. There were some typos in it. Thanks, Isaac. I really appreciate that. And uh, I will correct them first. Are there any questions left? Then it's weekend, at least for me. <laughs> okay, thanks. Yeah, I'll go.
you. See you in January. So, I will end the recording in close room.